The tigers have morphed into monsters that keep on growing at a speed and to a scale that's electrifying. They've developed a voracious appetite. They're hungry and they need to be fed. They're gobbling up power like there's no tomorrow. From here, and here, and here. Laos is going to get rich by selling uh, power to its neighbours. Tonight, how this backwater plans to become the power station of Asia. But can life in and around this mighty river cope or survive? If I were in Australia, I'd say this is something that I would be vehemently against. Hello and welcome to Foreign Correspondent. I'm Mark Corcoran. It's not so very different to the story of the Murray-Darling. A vital natural resource pressed and stretched to breaking point. Only the massive Mekong River is the lifeblood of a number of nations and tens of millions of people. It courses through some of the most dramatically expanding communities and economies on Earth. And others that have simply stood still. Now, one of those struggling nations wants to plug into the economic explosion that's propelled China into prosperity with a staggering series of dam projects. Here's Southeast Asia correspondent Zoe Daniel on a river under siege. It's a serene place of staggering beauty and appealing isolation. A spiritual remnant of old Southeast Asia, where Buddhism is revered. It's underdeveloped and it's poor. In overcrowded Asia, Laos is a rarity, relatively underpopulated with just six million people. But it has water and lots of it. The Mekong is, compared to other large river systems, still quite a healthy river. It's a river that runs free for the lower part of its length. It's a river that uh, produces the largest freshwater fishery in the world of any river basin. But of course, it's a river that's changing very quickly. It's changing quickly because of people, money and power. An otherwise old-fashioned communist regime is in charge. That means journalists often have a tough time getting in, and if you do, you're shadowed, as we were, by a government minder. But there was little interference, and for 10 days we moved fairly freely, following the twists and turns of the Mekong from north to south. To see for ourselves how this Amazon of Asia will be profoundly transformed, from a largely untamed force of nature into a huge humming powerhouse. The question is, at what cost? It runs for almost 5,000 kilometres from the mountains of Tibet to Vietnam's Mekong Delta. This river is a highway providing transport, food, and a way of life for more than 60 million people. Until now, it's been one of the world's last largely untouched wild rivers. But now there are plans for a series of dams along its tributaries and mainstream, and 55 of them are in Laos. For a long time, Lao decision makers and many of those advising the Lao government have been sold on the idea that Laos is 
to use some of the hyperbole, a, a new Kuwait to Southeast Asia, the new Switzerland to Southeast Asia, is going to get rich by selling uh, power to, uh, to its neighbours. So far, dams haven't blocked the Mekong in Laos, but they're already scouring mountain valleys and altering watercourses. This reservoir just feels endless. In the wet season, and we're getting towards the end of it now, it swells to about 450 square kilometres. I'm travelling with one of the many internationals involved in developing Laos, Englishman Aidan Glendinning. It's quite beautiful in a ghostly sort of way. is taking us to the Nam Turn 2 Dam, the biggest infrastructure project in the country. High on the Nakai Plateau, it's generating power for export by diverting water from one Mekong tributary to another. So we just create the reservoir here, and we take the water off the other end of the plateau, drop it down 350 metres to the power station. That's where all the generation is done. In this project, we're on the dam wall here, but the power station is about 70 kilometres that way. Without foreign companies and capital, it's unlikely Laos could get anything like this up and running. It's cost one and a half billion US dollars and was funded by the World and Asian Development Banks, attracting investors like the ANZ Bank. The capacity is 1,070 megawatts. 1,000 megawatts is exported to Thailand and 70 megawatts is reserved for domestic use here in Laos. And how much profit comes back down? Well, over the concession period, which is 25 years, that the private operator runs the dam, it's about $80 million per year comes directly to the government in revenues, which will be, over that period, more than $2 billion. Will the dam do more good than harm? It's too early to tell. The dam's operators have had to spend $100 million to monitor and improve water quality in the reservoir and the downstream river system. Australian Stephen Duthie runs the environmental program here. As an environmental scientist, does it go against the grain for you to be altering a river system in this way? Obviously, altering any natural ecosystem is something that one would like to avoid. If I were in Australia, I'd say this is something that I would be vehemently against. But when you look at the contribution that this project makes to Lao GDP, for the benefits that have come to the local community, and the fact that Laos has few natural resources to bring it out of poverty, one has to balance uh, these conflicting um, issues. It's a question thousands of Lao people are asking themselves as villages are uprooted and relocated, leaving traditionally subsistence communities to grapple with unfamiliar ways of life. Most of these people have been moved for only two or three years, and there's no way that we can say it's a success, it's finished for at least a few more years. So in terms of the livelihoods, making sure that the people can earn money from the land, that's where the real challenge lies. Um, and it, it's going to take a long-term investment. On the other side of the mountain, another dam company has given these people a brand new village. But it's far from their farms and animals, and from the river where it was easy to catch fish. Now village meetings are about the higher cost of living and somehow developing new sources of income closer to home. <laughs> Champa and his neighbours had no say in the location of the new village. It was chosen by the government and the dam company. So can you tell me about your house? <laughs> You have power? Uh, me. You have the TV? Uh, me. CD. Uh. Uh. 
Champa likes his connections to the modern world, but worries about an income. The food he used to grow or catch now has to be bought at the market. Sompon Samalavong represents the dam company that's changing things along Champa's part of the Mekong Basin. Turn Hinbun Dam has been operating on one of the tributaries for 12 years. Some family, they are very big. 19 persons, 18 persons. <laughs> he believes life has changed for the better around here. They have new house, they have electricity, free of charge for connections, and we build the line. The overwhelming benefit, though, is money for a government not used to seeing much of it. It's very high internal rate of return, very high profit project and very successful. The government can earn quite a lot of money. Every year we, we produce for around 61, 62 million for revenue. And the 60% of the dividend, it's, it's going to the government. His company is now building another power plant next door, doubling revenue by doubling the amount of water through the turbines. And that means another 11 villages will be moved. We do not deny that most of the Lao people, in particular those living in the country, still living under poverty line, having uh, income less than two US dollars uh, per day. The government claims that hydropower is the quickest way to raise living standards. Laos has seen neighbouring economies explode and wants to do the same. It's aiming for 7% growth, selling electricity to its neighbours. China's provided some of the inspiration it's already built four dams on the upper Mekong, and there'll be at least four more. That's changed the flow of the river, but it's the plans to build many dams on the lower stretches of the Mekong that's raising international concern. The Lao government has just told its neighbours, Thailand, Cambodia and Vietnam, that it intends building the first Mekong dam on its mainstream at Zayaburi. It's a test case, and it may well dictate the future of the river. Vietnam is very keen to protect the delta, which is a highly productive, not only for agriculture and rice production, but also increasingly for fish production, and wants to avoid any reduction in water flows in the river, which could affect and increase salinity. Laos has significant plans for developing its hydropower potential, not just for the domestic market, but also to sell to its neighbours who uh, have strong demand and use that foreign exchange to fund some of its uh, socio-economic development plans. So I, you can see that there are you know, potential uh, tensions there. The Mekong River Commission, based in the capital, will spend six months analysing the Zayaburi Dam project. It has the politically sensitive job of trying to stop dams triggering environmental and social disasters and sparking conflicts. But its powers are limited. The big uncertainty with all of these projects is the, the question of fist passage and to what extent a barrier across the, uh, the river would uh, impact on wild fisheries, on capture fisheries. Its role may be changing, but for all of human history, the Mekong has been the provider. Six-year-old Kamai and his father fish every day. Their existence flows with the rhythm of the river. 
โอ้ลุมเมนามนี้มีความสําคัญไล่โอ้เพราะว่าเฉพาะเขานี่ลุมเมนเคยอยู่น้ำเงาเคยห้าคนห้ากินตามเมนามข้องนี้บุเคยเฮ็ดน้ำอื่นสันสาเนาะเขาอยู่บนขั้วเรื่องชัวร์แคมลาและเขาพาหลานแค่พอจะได้รับอาหารเพื่อให้ครอบครัวได้กินขายแต่ปัจจุบันการเติบโตของอุตสาหกรรมแปลว่าราคาของอาหารบนทะเลเติบโตแคมลาบอกว่าแม่แมงคงส์บันทึกอยู่ในระดับต่ำสิบปีแรกในสมัยสมัยนี้ป้าถึงบัดกระลุงกระลุงเลยผมเห็นซีซีซีเลยงมไปตามนี้สิเดี๋ยวนี้บุได้มือมือได้สามสี่ตัวปนัยมันเป็นแปลงคือคือว่าเมื่อกี้แล้วมันไล่ขุนซอกเนี่ยแต่ก่อนนี้มันไล่ขุนเดี๋ยวนี้มันไล่ขุนพระกรรมมาซอกป่านมันเราบุได้ไก่มาให้เป็ดหน่อยเราเนี่ยบักย่าง You can't overstate the importance of fish to people living in the Mekong Basin. The fish they catch or buy make up as much as 80% of their daily protein. This is the largest freshwater fishery in the world, and dams would interfere with the annual floods that make it so. Most of the 1,200 odd Mekong fish species are migratory, and uh, fish can't swim past dams. Professor Phil Hirsch has spent decades working in Southeast Asia, and runs the Australian Mekong Resource Centre at the University of Sydney. Usually between mid-May and mid-June each year. He's one outside expert here, opposed to dams on the Lower Mekong Mainstream. The benefits that come from dams are highly concentrated. They come through the revenues from selling power. They come from tax revenues, and so it's an easy way to concentrate the economic benefits uh, of the river. Uh, whether or not those benefits are larger than than those that are destroyed by the dams uh, is, is another question. Environmental activism is building. The World Wildlife Fund is lobbying all governments, campaigning against Mekong mainstream dams. Nine are planned for Laos alone, with more in Cambodia. The WWF says that fish species will be lost forever, even if only one dam goes ahead. One of the flagship species for the Mekong River is the Mekong giant catfish. And this is one of the largest freshwater fish in the world. It can reach up to 350 kilos in weight. And in our view, any dam that's created in that stretch of the river, including Saibuli, and will block the migration path of the species, and therefore will herald its extinction in the wild because it won't be able to migrate up upstream to spawn. Is it possible that the giant Mekong catfish will die out if that dam goes ahead? I think this is a strong risk for the upper part of the Mekong. Is that an acceptable risk? Well, that's a question for the countries to consider. I mean, it's a cultural issue. It uh, has very high significance for populations here. But as I said, it's already under tremendous pressure. It has to be balanced against the benefits of hundreds of millions of dollars of potential revenues. is more than sustenance and money. It's a connection between people that even we can feel after 10 days following the river. Rejoining its course, we head south along with the morning commuters. Reminders of the enduring human history of the Mekong are rarely far away. On this stretch in Champasak, there are astonishing historic ruins that reflect the spiritual power of the river. The temple is called Wat Hu and dates from the 5th century. It's been a place of worship for the locals for 1,500 years because of its position on the mountain above the Mekong, the river they call Mother. Wat Pu perches at the junction of the mountains and the plain. 
Here, the Mekong widens and then splays out into a series of channels, creating the Sipandon, or literally 4,000 islands, a spectacular haven for wildlife. It's here that the longest waterfall in Southeast Asia, which in full flood is 14 kilometres wide, spills over the border into Cambodia. It's a major tourist attraction, but it represents more than a good picture opportunity. At this time of year, it sends water hurtling south as far as Vietnam, part of a unique process that floods the lower reaches of the river, dumps rich silt on farmlands and provides nutrients for fish. It's estimated that in terms of the dependency of both Laos and Cambodia on these fisheries, that any dam in that area would be the single most devastating impact um, and would bring about an immediate change in the ecology of the river. Of all the planned dams on the Mekong, it's a proposed dam here on the Dom Sahong Channel that's causing the most concern. Some predict that more than 40% of Cambodia's fish would be wiped out if this and other dams are built on the Mekong mainstream. In the dry season, this is the only channel through the islands that holds enough water to allow fish to swim upstream. In that area, there are a thousand islands, whereby a thousand creeks. So Don Sohong is, a, is only one creek uh, will be I mean, will be blocked. Yeah, by but that's the, dam. the only one the fish can get yeah. through, isn't it? So, the project has so designed if that creek is closed, I mean, the fish uh, may be able to swim up and down to the other creeks. Mm -hmm. This is just, uh, just uh, the view of uh, a non fish expert. There's another likely impact of a dam here. One of the world's most endangered marine mammals is at risk. We're in southern Laos looking for the elusive Irrawaddy dolphin. There are only around 100 left in the wild and about 14 here. They can be seen, but it's not easy. The Irrawaddy dolphin is rare in the Mekong Basin. With so few left in the wild, Travellers come from all over the world to this very place on the Laos-Cambodian border in the hope of spotting one. A dam nearby would certainly change their habitat and probably wipe them out. The potential dangers of the Don Sahong Dam and other dams are so extreme that the World Wildlife Fund wants a 10-year moratorium on all dam developments on the Mekong River. We believe that would give ample opportunity for developers, governments, and communities, NGOs, to sit down and really discuss what innovative and alternative ways there are to generate the energy that's needed for this region to ensure that Laos and Cambodia develop as many other Southeast Asian countries have, but do it in a way that's sustainable, that doesn't jeopardize um, the livelihoods of so many people and jeopardise what is arguably uh, the most biodiverse river in Asia. Local village chief, Kamon Pan Boon, knows that his people and place will be changed forever if the Don Sohong Channel is dammed. Laos wants to become the battery of Asia, and looking at the raw power of this river, the potential for development is obvious. But so is the chance of conflict between the countries who are the caretakers of the Mekong. 
An environmental catastrophe on any part of the river will have a flow-on effect to all the other Mekong communities. Only careful, sustainable development will preserve the mother of all rivers for the children of the future. So how much is too much for the Mekong? Zoe Daniel and the challenges of sustainable development in Southeast Asia. Well, that's the program for tonight. Don't forget to stay in touch with us on our website. We're on Facebook and Twitter as well. Until next time, good night. <laughs>